Hello, everyone. We're just about getting started again after the break. I'm very pleased to welcome all of us back to session two of TikTok Cultures Research Network's event on TikTok methodologies. As a general reminder for those of us who are just joining in midway, the session is being recorded and will be archived on our website, but the Q&A as well as the chat box will remain private. You're also most welcome to follow us along on Twitter at TikTok Cultures or hashtag TikTok Cultures. And finally, you are all invited to use the Q&A function to direct any queries to our members in this session. Without further ado, I'm really excited and privileged to hand over the time to our moderator, Dr. Claire Sutherland, to run the second session on operationalizing a TikTok project. Over to you, Claire. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure um, to welcome you to the second session today, operate, operationalizing a TikTok project. Um, and it's a real pleasure to introduce to you our three exceptional panelists today who all have experience conducting innovative and exciting research projects on TikTok. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jin Lee. Uh, Jin studies media intimacies in social media cultures, particularly media practices and the visibility of social minorities on various media platforms. She is a co-founding member of the TikTok Cultures Research Network and is conducting a project on TikTok cultures and industry in South Korea and East Asia at large with Associate Professor Crystal Aberdeen. And she is a research fellow in internet studies at Curtin University. We are also delighted to welcome Dr. Jorge Vasquez Hero, who is an assistant professor at the, in the, the Department of Communication Sciences, University of Santiago de Compostela. He has a PhD in communication and contemporary information. He is a member of Novos Media Research Group and the Latin American Chair of Transmedia Narratives. His research focuses on the impact of technology and platform, platforms in digital journalism and narratives. And his most re recent publications deal with digital storytelling and innovation, fact-checking initiatives in digital journalism, and the analysis of media and journalists on TikTok. And our final pan panelist, is Dr. Zhu Chen, who is an assistant professor at the School of Journalism, Communication, Jiamen uh, University. He achieved his doctoral degree at the Digital Media Research Center in, at Queensland University of Technology in 2020. And his research interests include platform studies, digital culture, and race, ethnicity, and sexuality. So you can see we've got a really exciting panel lined up today. So I thought in order to get our audience to get to know our panel a little bit better, we might get each panelist to talk a little bit about how they've utilized um, their research method on TikTok, and also talk a little bit about where you are situated in the world today, because we've got quite a um, diverse panel here and our previous panel was also quite diverse in terms of where we're located in the world. So starting with you, Jin, I thought we might get you to tell us where you're located in the world and what research method you've used primarily to study TikTok and a little bit of a basic description of how that method works. So if you could take us away, Jin. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, very nice to meet you all from South Korea because of the COVID-19, even though I'm working in a uh, Australian University. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I because I based I am based in South Korea. I studied TikTok, um, particularly in the context of South Korea culture and also in the influencer industry. So I've studied TikTok for a year and a half using combined ethnography digitally and traditionally, which involves um, traditional ethnography such as going to the field work, having an in-depth interviews and the participant observation and uh, around the MCN industry, but also the um, digital digital ethnography such as just a participant observation of social media um, TikTok content, which some people say lurking, but also following the digital estate of TikTokers, not just about the TikTok, but also their um, Instagram accounts and also YouTube account. Alongside that, I have observed um, what kind of discourses emerge and expand around the social media, this newly social media TikTok. So for example, news archiving, how news frame TikTok and how people People talk about TikTok by looking at um, K-pop forums or online forums, online communities, because that's the thing where people, before joining the TikTok, they talk about TikTok and then decide whether to join TikTok. So that's the one thing that I have observed. 
So by combining these ethnographic methodologies, I have a um, study that how TikTok has established its new culture by working or navigating the existing or newly emerging cultures and industries such as K-pop industry, traditional entertainment industry, but also um, the influence of culture and industry. So that's where I am located in right now. I'm looking at that kind of things. Fantastic. And so fascinating to hear about how your research kind of takes you off TikTok onto kind of other platforms as well. That's fantastic. And um, Jorge, do you want to uh, go next? Tell us kind of where you're located in the world and kind of what your primary method for looking at TikTok is and a little bit about that method. Hello to everyone. Thank you for the invitation to the TikTok Culture Research Network. I'm uh, physically in La Coruña, Spain, in the northwest of Spain, but our research uh, is situated more in the impact of technologies and platforms on journalists and narratives. So TikTok is an emerging platform and we are trying to know what happens there. Um, we always try to consider a, a global perspective that overcomes the limitations of a vision close to a specific country. So um, one factor is proximity. We try to consider other countries in the European context, but also language is, a, is an important factor because we have a common language with the Latin American region. So we try to also to, to look at that uh, continent in, in the world. And our research methods, and I would like to say that it's not only me working on this at the University of Santiago de Compostela, also Dr. Cruz Negreira, uh, our approaches at the moment until now is journalism on TikTok. Um, we made a database of news media brands there and uh, we uh, developed content analysis. Uh, the second one was the intersections between TV and TikTok. So looking at uh, what channels and programs from the TV were uh, doing on TikTok. And the last one that is unpublished at the moment is journalists on TikTok. So how the professionals of journalism are uh, performing their role in on TikTok with, again, a database a mapping which people is there, uh, content analysis, and also a survey of, of um, professionals on TikTok. If there is any questions about this, we can uh, talk more later. Thank you. That is so fascinating. Um, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions about um, your research. And uh, Jude, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about where you're situated in the world and uh, what research method you primarily use and give us a little bit of the, the basic introduction to that method? Uh, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm currently based in Xiamen, China. Xiamen is a, a coastal city. It's very beautiful and uh, uh, I actually achieved my doctoral degree in Queensland University last year. Uh, in my PhD project, uh, uh, I focused on dating platforms, Tinder and uh, uh, Tantan. And in the final year of my, of my PhD, I expanded my interest on platform studies. So I uh, look at uh, uh, short video apps, TikTok and uh, Douyin with my uh, research team. So in my uh, previous research on TikTok, uh, we mainly used uh, concepts and the methods from platform studies to analyze TikTok. Uh, I guess the methods we used uh, uh, are content analysis. We use that to uh, research a uh, uh, feature called positive energy on Douyin. And we also used uh, the walkthrough method to uh, examine and con contrast uh, TikTok and uh, Douyin. Uh, we, uh, look at uh, how they are similar in the surface level, but they can be quite different from platform governances and uh, uh, their markets. Uh, and currently in Xiamen University, I'm still uh, doing research on platforms, uh, including dating app platforms and uh, uh, short video platform Douyin and uh, TikTok. And I'm uh, collaborating with my colleague here on a project looking at uh, China's uh, cultural images on TikTok. And we try to use some uh, digital methods like uh, web screening to uh, collect uh, comments and videos from TikTok related to some uh, Chinese cultural stuff. And uh, we also uh, plan to use sentimental analysis to analyze the comments uh, below these videos. But still, uh, this is an ongoing project. And uh, in this session today, uh, I guess I will primarily talk about uh, the walkthrough method. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a it's such a fascinating uh, group of panelists here today with such diverse um, methods as well to, that we can kind of get a sense of the different um, concerns those different methods might bring, but also what might be similar across those methods. And I think that's something that you touched on, Jorge, that I think we can kind of um, bring across all the different methods is kind of the issue of um, where you're kind of situated in the world, which you raised, which was really interesting. And given we know that TikTok content um, is very personalized for users based on the kind of location that they're in, which is something we talked about in the previous panel, um, how do you kind of deal with this? And how do you think about your research in terms of where you're situated in the world? Do you kind of see this as a challenge or do you see it as an opportunity? And I think, um, and how do you kind of as a researcher deal with the issue of personalization? Um, you sort of touched on this a bit, Jorge. So do you want to start um, this question kind of responding to the issue of personalization? Well, uh, we for the moment analyzed uh, content from a specific accounts. So um, we didn't analyze content recommended by the algorithm. So we identify the users of interest for our study, for example, news media organizations or journalists, and analyze what they have published or how they interact with uh, their audience. But location uh, in, in our research can affect the trends we see, for, for example, we, we find, and also uh, our language could um, uh, make some uh, impact on the search. Um, maybe a solution or a better way to to understand uh, this uh, should be performing a, an ethnographic uh, approach it would be necessary to start with uh, probably with a new account uh, with a clean profile with any uh, history or assume that our situation in the world is uh, affecting the personalization of the content and about the um, challenge or an opportunity well um, from a scientific perspective I think it's a, a challenge when conducting a, a research uh, we should have a neutral point of view and if the algorithm affects what we see we add a bias that is I think difficult to manage and um, how we uh, think about uh, and work with the personalization uh, I think is a positive consequence from the user side for the consumer if it's a, a good a point uh, of the platform but a great difficulty uh, again to evaluate uh, scientific, scientifically what happens. We must take into account that any decision uh, to watch or not to watch a video, to give a like or to share it is influencing the content uh, recommended by the, by the app. So um, a challenge that, that arises uh, would be to simulate a behavior with a certain pattern and see what happens maybe, but it's very difficult because the algorithm is like a black box and we don't know exactly what, hap what happens in it. Uh, although it's also a method that I have not tested yet. <laughs> Thank you, that's that's such an interesting reflection. And I wonder if, um, Jin, for example, your research being qualitative research and being um, ethnographic research, you might have a different perspective on personalization. Sure, um, my computer stopped a little bit, so yeah. Um, so I guess it was opportunity for me to think about like how we think or conceptualize methodology. Methodology is not just uh, collecting the data, it's a process because I believe that that's one thing that we encounter as a qualitative researcher when we study about these newly emerging social media platforms like TikTok. So for example, TikTok um, generates a content that is designed for you, so your online person is already organized by TikTok's algorithm, even though you don't have anything um, TikTok yet. Like, so I don't, I didn't post anything on TikTok, but the contents that are generated for me is like a cosmetics, a beauty, makeups and fashions and some K-pops based on my, I don't know, like a demographics. And also some advertisements that are shown to me is like a cosmetic products, also some supplements for children that, that should be taken care of their moms, even though I don't have any children. So that's one thing that you have to navigate. So um, instead of using my smartphone, I chose to use my spare phone so that way my data doesn't affect, you know, my data don't affect my contents that, or my research. But even though you use that kind of things that the contents or the data that you are collecting or the 
the, the data that you are seeing are not really objective from the perspective of traditional social science. So you have to navigate to that kind of thing. So I think that when you study about TikTok or newly emerging this kind of you know, social media apps, um, taking, consider, taking into account that how you are involved in this news in this research rather than just presenting your data as this is what I have done and this is very objective you are already filtered and your contents are already filtered through that kind of algorithm and also the um, research uh, methodology or process so having that in mind um, designing the methodology is a key thing that we need to consider as we expand our research on TikTok another thing that I like to expand about um, um, is the concept of being situated in the TikTok. So one thing that I mentioned is how TikTok is situating yourself in this technological platform. The other thing is how TikTok and yourself are situated in the culture and the industry. So for example, when TikTok is mentioned and then emerges as a new culture and a very innovating culture among young people, a lot of news media, especially from the from the Western side of the world or the first, side, first world of the side of the world, have mentioned that TikTok is really dangerous for you know like young people because it's developed by a Chinese company, so it has some security concerns and it leaks the information of users and also it benefits the Chinese government, and that was the case of South Korea as well. So when I have an interview, when I had an interview with people in the MCN industry, people even don't um, make money from TikTok, but they don't consider TikTok as a very serious way. They just consider, oh, this is a Chinese app, um, we, we will go away even in like two or three years, or you know, like oh, it's just a children's app. So they just use it. I don't know what's the algorithm or what's the what's the functionality or that kind of thing. So it is very important to go into this stuff by navigating these dilemmas or racist or classist perception of the industry uh, of the industry that people already have because of the discourse about TikTok. So um, performing some labor, additional labor, like, you know, following social normativity, like, you know, like showing yourself as a very submissive femininity and say, oh, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, could you explain a little bit more? That kind of things was very uh, teeny tiny thing that I have to develop. But also that's the something that how you are and also TikTok is situated in the culture and the industry. So when you do ethnographic, that kind of things, that additional labor is something that you always have to do. But if TikTok or, you know, social platforms like a TikTok emerges from that kind of non-traditional ways developed from, you know, other countries and not other side and, you know, other side of the Western world, then it's. It's very crucial to how you navigate this, you know, being situated. I think that's something that we need to think about doing ethnography. Yeah. That's such a good point, the kind of richness of what context means and what being situated means. Um, and I wonder if, um, Zhu, you have any reflections on what, how you kind of think about context and situatedness in the, in the context of something like the app walkthrough method that you used, um, given that kind of, yeah, the, that that might be something that you factor into thinking about how you might walk through something like a, an app like TikTok. Yeah, by uh, using the walkthrough method, I guess this method is uh, quite flexible and adaptable. You can always alter, the, alter it based on your research questions and on the uh, research subjects. So in our project, uh, we compare uh, TikTok and Douyin. Um, so uh, as, as to the uh, situ situationness of the uh, research, as we uh, want to compare the cultural differences of the two platforms, although uh, they all were made in China, uh, they face different uh, markets and different uh, users. Um, I guess uh, we, uh, in our research uh, team, we have one like, from China and myself and one from the US. Uh, so we uh, analyzed uh, TikTok based on a Western pr perspective. Also, I analyzed uh, Douyin based on a Chinese perspective and we want to compare uh, how the differences uh, can uh, kind of play out in their uh, app interfaces and uh, their uh, digital architectures. Uh, yeah, and uh, also about the uh, content personali personalization uh, in our research, 
we use uh, we used a technique that, that we didn't uh, log in to the uh, apps actually. So we just uh, browsed uh, these apps and uh, focused on their uh, interfaces and uh, features. Yeah, this is actually the uh, what the walkthrough method focuses on. Uh, this is a method that not uh, directly engage with the contents of these platforms. Uh, it just uh, reveal the cultural discourses associated with technological uh, mechanisms. Um, I guess this is a way to uh, deal with the content personalization. And, uh, again, is this is uh, based on your research questions because in our research question we didn't uh, uh, look at so much about the content, and uh, we combine the walkthrough method with platformization theory. So it's more about uh, theoretical building. Uh, so we 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 are able to critically engage with the uh, platform itself. Uh, without uh, looking at so much on the content. Thank you. It's so interesting to think about the different issues that come up for different methods. So the walkthrough method kind of um, by kind of focusing on the interface um, might kind of run into some run into less of those issues around the kind of um, moderation. Uh, I was thinking about as well, like how different methods might encounter issues around things like ethics, for example, like ethics seem to be uh, something that kind of came up a little bit in the previous session. Um, and so this may may kind of apply differently to kind of different methods and different projects, but kind of how do you make decisions, especially on a kind of platform like TikTok that's sort of changing so much um, and so quickly, and it's kind of largely publicly accessible, but how do you make decisions um, ethically around what content you think can be studied and what content you think um, shouldn't be studied or should be kind of, um, yeah, should be, should be private. And what do you think are the kind of main lessons around ethics that you've learned as a kind of TikTok researcher? So I might start with Jin, because I think this probably is a, a question that mostly applies to your research. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think having the key concept as a key concept of research ethics as a process is important rather than just, uh, oh, okay, so I have an ethics, I would just follow because you encounter so much dilemma, so many dilemmas that you never imagined before. So for example, when TikTok is very popular for young children, then how do you see that these people are over 18 years old so that you can meet the IRB, right? You never know until you actually talk to them. And then there is also possibility that people just, you know, deceive you and like, say, oh, I'm an adult, you know, then, you know, how you navigate these kind of little tiny research ethics that you, your institution has imposed upon you. So that's one thing. The other thing is also being trolled or being tracked by, um, you know, people who, after your research, by, by, people who you study. So for example, when you study about some, you know, like a very malicious content uh, you know, on TikTok, and then you study about it for social justice, then you are being trolled. And so this is something that we need to think about um, as a researcher that people in the previous era or people in the previous studies haven't thought about it. People talk about a lot about how to protect these people you collect the data, but how you protect the people from, you know, th this kind of thing. So um, as of the, in the previous session, Julie, um, Diana also mentioned a lot about, you know, like a probably contacting your platforms rather than just distributing your information, contact information or email address or phone number is one thing, but also after you publish your data or your research and how you protect yourself, especially um, the K-pop fans are very enthusiastic. When you talk about something that is not favorable to them, then how you contact, protect yourself, that's one thing that you need to think about. Well, there is no fixed the one you know one absolute day, um, answer for this because this eth research ethic is a process you have to navigate and then, then the process and then pose yourself as a researcher and also the user of the TikTok and the 
um, the person in the society. So, but I believe that um, how you want to draw some lines, so then how you can navigate the kind of, this kind of line is a very key important things. And also I like to mention that um, the fabrication of the data is one thing that we can develop further. And then this is a really, really important thing to protect the user and also to protect yourself from the research after research. So, and then um, Mark Kemp's the idea of a fabrication, you know, you know like rather than just um, showing the presenting the data as itself, but, you know, just adjusting a little bit of words so that's not unsearchable or, or you know, like um, deleting um, the user information when you cite something. That's one thing that also very practical thing that you can do as a part of the research ethics. But also I think that, you know, going to the TikTok and then having in this mind that you are a researcher, but also you are a user, then how you deal with this dilemma as a two people is a key thing that you can consider as you develop your research and then process your research. Yeah. Thank you. Those are such practical tips um, for, I think a lot of people kind of can be sometimes quite naive about the, the process of going into these projects, but it's such an important thing to remember that you yourself as a researcher can sometimes be um, at risk after the process. Um, and, and Jorge, do you have any kind of reflections on when you're doing data collection? Do you kind of, um, what's the process of thinking about the ethics of it, even when it is publicly available data? Yes. Regarding uh, how we make decisions and what uh, can be studied on TikTok, um, for us, is an, we, we, our priority area is journalism. So this is an emerging platform. It uses growing. Uh, there is a new audience there that is interesting for, for this uh, field. So let's see what happens there. That's the first uh, idea that uh, brings, uh, takes us to, to TikTok. So um, about the main lessons uh, after doing research on, on TikTok about ethics, um, I have only some ideas uh, complementary to what uh, Jean have uh, said previously. Uh, the first learning is not only about TikTok. Uh, research on such a platform uh, must be transparent. I mean, uh, it's con constantly changing. So it's very important to define well the parameters we are uh, studying because uh, someone else uh, will find new limitations trying to replicate our research in maybe in, in a few weeks after publishing our work. Uh, that's happening every month. Uh, uh, research methods or data collection methods are changing because the platform is is changing rapidly. Changing rapidly, sorry. Uh, second, it's necessary to take distance uh, because the fact that the platform changes uh, so fast uh, forces the the researchers to uh, consider longitudinal studies or at least uh, sampling over a period of time, not just a specific moment. So if we are studying um, a topic or what the news media are doing, we avoid uh, looking only at one week or two weeks because uh, also um, the pattern of publication is very different than the frequency and that. So it's important to take some distance and, and look at um, longer periods of time. Uh, the third idea um, would be related to the uh, to handling personal data. So it, that's similar to what Jean said, because in our case, it's not so risky because we are analyzing uh, public figures, but also um, you know, they could be individual users, more private uh, users or minors. And um, uh, also the analysis of the mood or the convergence of humor and information that is something that can occur in, on TikTok could have uh, ethical and cultural implications that we must consider in, in the next uh, studies. Thank you. Yeah, that's, there's so many important things to consider that kind of ethics really goes beyond the idea of say getting consent or kind of um, it gets sort of more and more complicated the more you think about the the context of your data. Um, Ju, did you have any reflections on the way that ethics kind of plays out in your research? Uh, yeah, uh, in my previous uh, research uh, project on TikTok, uh, as I mentioned before, we didn't engage with uh, users so much. So it could be less risky, but by 
uh, using the method such as content analysis and the walkthrough method, uh, will still be mindful of uh, some ethical considerations. Uh, for example, the walkthrough method, I mean, the, the major uh, forms of data collected through walkthrough method can be uh, field notes, screenshots, or some videos. And uh, we didn't uh, purposely uh, uh, collect uh, users' information or, or some uh, data with uh, users' private, private uh, information. But still, there, there might be some collateral damage. Like we, if we collect the interface, the screenshot of the interface or platform, it, it may contain uh, some users' uh, information. Um, and uh, because, as I mentioned before, we didn't even log in the platform when we collect these screenshots. So it's almost impossible to get a permission of these users to publish you know, this uh, information. So if we, we want to use these screenshots in our uh, papers, we must uh, uh, de-identify this user information. And this is kind of a, a ethical consideration in the uh, walkthrough method. Thank you. And something that, that that kind of reminded me of thinking about the kind of de-identification um, that that was being raised there and kind of really the way that we might draw from kind of previous experience working on other social researching other social media platforms. I was wondering if the panelists could kind of reflect on how your research perhaps on other social media platforms has informed your kind of research on TikTok, sort of how does it, how is it similar or how is it different? Um, and whether you think perhaps um, some of the methods that you're using on TikTok or developing on TikTok could be used um, for researching on other social media platforms. So um, I might start with you, Jorge. Well, um, I think it's different when we are uh, thinking about aspects of the own logic of the social network. For example, navigation. We can access content by uh, hashtag, uh, profile, uh, sound, that is very different or um, some other uh, hashtags, for example. Um, so uh, that's one point. The other is that TikTok is also a micro video platform and mainly entertainment. So there are some language and aesthetics uh, issues that are characteristic of this platform, elements and resources that are used in the videos, for example, filters, original sound, non-original sound, uh, challenges, etc. that are different to other platforms and that uh, should um, um, take attention uh, in our research. In addition, this predominantly entertaining uh, character of the platform raises questions for us about how journalism can be adapted to this platform that has a, a tone that is different to, to news media brands. On the other hand, uh, for me, the big questions are the same as in other platforms. Uh, first, whether there is a presence of media and journalists, and second, what they are doing, how they present themselves, how they um, perform the, their role for society and what type of content they publish, what the strategies they use. And third, in the, the perspective of the audiences, which in the case of TikTok is especially interesting because they are the younger uh, generations that are avoiding uh, news media brands and traditional media and that. So um, also additionally, I would say that in terms of technical difficulties in carrying out the research, uh, TikTok presents us uh, with great challenges because it does not have uh, an official API. So access to data is much more complicated, requiring manual coding uh, almost the time. And I think that's all at the moment. That's really interesting. And I especially uh, really resonated with your point about the kind of playful um, humor of TikTok being a kind of fairly, you know, sort of unique um, element of the platform. Because of course, like humor it is across all social media platforms. But I think that we would all agree that there's something kind of um, uniquely TikTok-y about TikTok that kind of brings, that comes across in kind of all of the research projects. Um, Jin, did you want to uh, comment on kind of what you think is, what you think that how does TikTok differ in for your research project and, how, and what might that kind of bring sure. for you for future? 
Sure. Um, some of the similarities that I found on TikTok and other social media app is a messiness, of course, you know, like you have a vast amount of data and then you don't know how to collect the data and or you don't know how to connect to the interactions or meanings from this vast amount of data. So it is something that uh, a lot of social media scholars have to deal with. But another difference that I found is uh, this messiness is perhaps more serious compared to other social media because there is another discourse that is happening outside of TikTok when you go to in you know, the news archiving or there is another discourse that is emerging on online media platforms and uh, online forums that is not happening or that is not found on TikTok so you have to deal with this a vast amount of data that are scattered across the different media and also different news um, media outlets so it is a key thing that you have to make a note every day and then available make your yourself available all the time and on, on all the time also across the media platforms which I just casually call I am doing spatial spatial temporal labor because I have to always make a note even during in the my bed if something happens about TikTok then I just make a note not to miss anything but it's also time consuming and also exhausting as a researcher because it's not like a 24 7 job so yeah, that's something that a lot of people are dealing with or you know, conflicting in terms of the how to study about this amazing, exciting, but it's a kind of annoying sometimes app. So this is something, yeah. That's, that's yeah, such a resonating with me kind of reflection. Like I think that um, amazing and annoying are kind of excellent descriptors of the process of doing research on TikTok is the kind of, mess and difficulty to kind of carve out a neat um, project and certainly doing a lot of research from bed is very very deeply relatable to me um, and Zhu is there anything that you wanted to add a kind of about your experience taking the the app walkthrough method to TikTok and how you think that that the what you've learned might kind of apply to other platforms yeah um... Yeah, uh, I think TikTok is a, a novel uh, social media, but it's not uh, entirely new. Many of its technologies, like uh, algorithmic uh, recommendation and uh, video creation, we can see it in previous platforms or, or in other platforms. Uh, but as a, a new uh, platform, I think one significant feature is it's evolving so fast. I mean, uh, all social media platforms are, are evolving, but as a new platform, TikTok is, is, is especially evolving so fast. Like, uh, for example, in our previous project on Douyin, we, we uh, found a feature called positive energy, and we uh, published a paper based on this feature. But uh, after our paper is released, this uh, feature is not exist anymore. Uh, we don't know the reason why they removed this feature, and I, I think this. Uh, can be uh, very interesting, but also challenging for uh, research on TikTok. Yeah, as to the uh, walkthrough method, I guess for, because this method is also kind of a, a novel method, but it's also not entirely new. It combines uh, previous uh, theory and the concepts to analyze apps and uh, platforms. Uh, I guess for all digital platforms, we can use similar overarching strategies to do the walkthrough. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's always flexible and uh, adaptable. You can uh, alter the framework based on your research questions. Yeah, oh, the noise, I <laughs> hear the noise. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, that, that, that's how you can um, always uh, use different, uh, I mean, in the, in the, in the low level details and uh, uh, practical techniques. So you can always develop your own techniques uh, to walk walk through a specific platform. Thank you. That's such a good point about the way that the app walkthrough method has kind of already given us a bit of a framework for thinking about how a method can be taken across kind of multiple platforms. Um, and I might just jump into the kind of Q and A and give our audience a chance to kind of pick your brains so that they can kind of. Um, think about how they might take some of these methods into their own exciting and also challenging TikTok projects. Um, so I might start with Nadini's question, um, who asks, hi, Jorge, your study on professionals on TikTok sounds very interesting. Are there any interesting findings slash observations that you can share with us based on your study? 
Well, we can advance that journalists uh, continue, combine the informative purpose with showing aspects of their personal life that is also useful in, in other platforms, explaining their work and giving advice, answering questions from the users. Uh, we also found that they are mainly looking for the young audience there uh, or the audience who, do, who do not know them uh, yet which is logical and interesting because they are optimistic about the um, capabilities of this platform for news and journalistic content distribution. But uh, I will say that it's too early to give definitive results on this. Thank you. We also have, we have another question about um, the about Jorge's project. So Rafaela has asked, I saw some journalism related accounts on TikTok here in Brazil that started to emerge on the platform. Jorge, do you think that this will help spread information on to different generations? How do you see this way of changing the narratives um, of journalism content to fit a specific platform? Well, um, thank you for, for the question. It's a very important, uh, idea what or question what, what uh, Rafael is asking. Uh, it's true that uh, we found media from Brazil. I can remember UOL, uh, Stadao, Jornal da Record, um, I think uh, some news media brands uh, more. Um, I think it's a complementary platform uh, to spread information also for other uses and also misinformation. But uh, adaptation uh, here is not easy because it's not, I think it's not as simple as Facebook or Twitter, putting the link and sharing the link uh, with a headline. Here you have to get into the logic of the platform and adapt to the trends. So um, information that is something serious in, 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 in a first uh, uh, moment is, is not uh, easy to adapt, I think. But I hope it, it can be a, a good platform also for that. Thank you. And we have a really important question here from Anupa who asks um, a question regarding backup and storage of data. So they ask, in the event of social, a social media platform gets banned in the country you are located, for example, in India, how do you plan for storage, which is such an important question. Perhaps um, Zhu might be able to address that question. Yeah, regarding the data backup and the storage. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, we studied a feature on Douyin, it's called Positive Energy. And we collected uh, over 800 videos from this feature. And uh, when we paper got published, this feature doesn't exist. So I guess, yeah, the, these uh, 800 videos can be yeah, important uh, data archive. We can, we can do further research on, on these uh, videos. Um, and, uh, yeah, this question, this question said in India is banned. I think in China we have the similar problem. Although TikTok is a Chinese platform, it's not available in China. So in China, we only have access to Douyin, but we cannot use TikTok. And this is really annoying. I tried some uh, techniques. Even I use VPN, it's not accessible. I mean, if I use VPN, I can use Facebook in China, but I cannot use TikTok. And uh, I such a mind times there finally there is a solution is that uh, use a device like an uh, iPad and uh, plus VPN finally I have access to TikTok in China I guess this is because of the Chinese SIM card in my phone so if I take the Chinese SIM card out of my phone I can still use TikTok with VPN in, in China so maybe yeah, they can try this method uh, in India also. I, I haven't tried, I don't know. Maybe it, it was a try. Thank you. That I mean, that sounds like a, a very sophisticated and very impressive process. Um, and also it's a real it's a real ongoing challenge as you know, countries can continue to make um, drastic changes to which apps are permitted. Jin, do you have anything to add to that um, based on your experience? 
Um, yeah, sure. Um, TikTok is available still in South Korea, luckily, but perhaps like making notes is a key thing because I also found myself left without like incomplete data when, you know, people just to ghost it out or people just to delete the account or remove the account or, you know, something happens on social media. So it's always, you know, like taking a notes is a key thing, but also when you uh, I like to emphasize that you don't have to store everything <laughs> because it's a vast amount of data that you have to uh, deal with eventually. So, you know, like making a note, um, I don't think this is a sufficient, but maybe helpful um, things that you can use um, as a part of the research um, method. Yeah. Thank you so much. And that is just about our time. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of our excellent panelists for sharing all of their expertise. Um, and now I'm going to hand back over to Patrick. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, and uh, the only thing that remains for me is to, to wrap this seminar up. And uh, um, uh, thank you everyone for um, your your uh, participation in the two sessions and and I've uh, learned so much and it was so interesting to hear about your research and and how TikTok uh, differs from research in, in on other platforms uh, how to study a platform such as TikTok that is so diverse so personalized and uh, the importance of qualitative ethnographic research um, and and we've touched on on uh, uh, issues related to the safety for the researcher. Uh, and uh, ethical issues based on the simple fact that there, there are so many um, uh, young users of, of uh, underage users of, of uh, TikTok. And uh, we talked about um, the fact that TikTok is it's evolving so quickly. Uh, we talk, touched on that in the, in the second session, uh, which is really interesting, right? How do you study something that is evolving so quickly? And, and it's, it's a, 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 an eternal challenge for, for um, um, digital media researchers. So thank you all uh, for uh, this really engaging and interesting seminar. So uh, specifically, I want to, 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 to thank the speakers and the moderators. In the first session, we had uh, uh, Dr. Wei Wang as the moderator, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ariadna uh, Amaral, Dr. Uh, Milovan Savage, Dr. Diana uh, Zuli. And in the second um, session, we had uh, Claire Southerton moderating a session with uh, Zhu Shen, Jorge Vasquez Herrero, and Dr. Jin Li. And a couple of reminders uh, before we uh, uh, end the session. Um, the recordings will be available on, on tiktokcultures.com and uh, uh, please remember that there is a, a membership form available for to join the TikTok Cultures Research Network. Uh, there should be a link in the, the chat uh, uh, right now uh, or, or in a few seconds or something like that. And uh, uh, also please uh, remember that the next um, event in the uh, in, in, from the TikTok Cultures Research Network is TikTok and social movements, which is happening uh, in September uh, this year. So um, the event was brought to you uh, by the TikTok Cultures Research Network, and uh, it is supported by the Faculty of Humanities at uh, Curtin University, the Center for Culture and Technology at Curtin University and the Digital Media Research Center at Queensland University of Technology. So thank you all uh, supporters uh, of the event. And I want to thank, of course, my co-organizer, uh, Associate Professor Crystal Abedin and Dr. Bondi Kay, and everyone from around the world who zoomed into the web webinar today. I know that we've had some people even from Europe. So uh, Jose, for instance, and I think it's uh, about four or five o'clock in the morning or something like that in Europe. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, stay safe and enjoy uh, the rest of the day or uh, the morning or the night, wherever you are. So thank you so much.